Welcome to another episode of the Black Ministers Podcast. I'm your host, Nate. I'm here with my amazing co-host. Sebastian, happy to be here as always. Yes, indeed. And we have an amazing guest today, uh, someone who is wonderful at what they do and also just a wonderful person in general. Cheryl, say hello to hello, the audience. Hello, everyone. Perfect. Nice and to meet we, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk more about uh, Cheryl. We'll talk with her more about what she does in just a moment. But before we do, you know what it is. We have our menace moment. Uh, so bear with me today because I didn't research this one as well as I would have liked to. But it fits the theme of today. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about Jasmine Brown, who uh, is the author of a recently released book titled Twice as Hard, the stories of black women who fought to become physicians from the Civil War to the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and in that book, she spotlights black women in medicine whose stories often go overlooked. Um, so her journey uh, to where she is now began when she was fascinated by neuroscience in high school. Uh, she said that she was just amazed by how the brain worked and how it played such a central role in humans' ability to live and experience the world around us. And I can actually relate to that because I also became very fascinated with uh, neuroscience in high school. And then I enrolled in the BYU neuroscience program <laughs> and my fascination quickly, quickly <laughs> faded. And uh, I became much more interested in psychology on, because doctor. I just wanted to graduate <laughs> and get out of there. Um, but love neuroscience and love the way that the brain works and how we interact with it. Um, during her undergrad years, uh, she went to Washington University um, and she studied there and uh, began a, a medical or began aspiring towards a medical career. Um, and then during those years, she felt that she was a target of microaggressions that made her feel very unwelcome in medical and scientific spaces as a black woman. Um, so her personal observations and experiences led her to want to study racism in the scientific and medical field to better understand why this happens. Then she was selected to receive a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford University. Oh, come on. Which is crazy. Because if you don't know, Oxford real. University is in Oxford. England. Oxford. Yeah. I, yes. Is it actually in Oxford? I don't know. I just made that up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's over in, in, it's across the pond, as they say. You know, she was over there drinking bo -a -wa. A bo -a -wa. Bo -a -wa. Let me stop. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so she went to Oxford um, and she dedicated her time there to highlighting the experience of black women in medicine. And she fo focused her master's dissertation on social and structural barriers that have prevented black women from entering medicine throughout the U.S. while competing. Oh, no. Oh, I read that wrong. Um, yep. And then during her research, she found a large book on black physicians that had over 100 profiles. Wow. Oh, wow. I did not wow. know that existed. No, for real. Uh, fewer than five of the profiles were black women. Wow. Fewer yeah. than five. Why didn't they just say four or three? <laughs> anyway, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Over 100 profiles, fewer than five were profiles of black women. She was inspired by those stories um, and the obstacles they'd overcome. And so she was inspired to write her own book. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, yeah, when publishing the book, she had two major goals. She wanted to highlight minority physicians whose stories are rarely taught in schools and give students from underrepresented backgrounds role models that they can identify with. And secondly, she wanted to show the historical basis of the social and structural barriers in medicine that persist today. Um, and so let's see. She hopes that her book will inspire minority students across the country to reach for goals in medicine. She also hopes that the book she also hopes that the book helps to raise general awareness of the prejudices and discrimination that shaped the lives of remarkable women she profiled and that still affect minority students across the country today. So that is a little bit about Madam Jasmine Brown or doctor. Is she a doctor? Dr. Jasmine Brown? I'm not sure. More intelligent than me. Right. Jasmine Brown. Very smart. <laughs> Jasmine Brown. Black queen Jasmine Brown. Yes. Um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about her, and uh, she is amazing for the stories that she is telling. The reason that I wanted to do Jasmine as the highlight today was because Cheryl, you have some experience in the field of medicine, and you are currently studying midwifery. midwifery. Is that mm -hmm. correct? You yeah. want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, about what you do, yeah. who you are, all of that. Absolutely, yeah. So my name is Cheryl, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, originally. Um, I actually didn't plan on becoming a midwife. It kind of just fell into my lap, literally. <laughs> um, so I grew up in sports as well. So I did um, volleyball and basketball growing up, but um, I also did dance. And so, um, you know, I had a couple of trainers who saw some potential in me. So I was lucky enough to go on and start dancing professionally. And then oh, wow. in uh, high school, um, I got a couple of offers. Um, one of them was from the University of Utah. And so they flew me out for an audition and I got in and that's kind of how I ended up 
uh, in Utah to begin with. And so I danced for the department and um, I felt like I was kind of in between because I knew I wanted to help people on a grander scale. And I've always been a lover of the arts. I think that will never leave me just simply because it's just, it's in the fabric of who I am. But I wanted to kind of extend more and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And so I was in between majors and I started dabbling in nursing. So I started taking nursing pre prerequisites, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in the hospital setting because I'd worked in hospitals as a CNA and I just didn't really like the environment. Mm. And I think I was too young to realize that it was microaggressions that were happening to mm. me and that I just felt really isolated mm. in that space, um, especially just being one of the only black workers on the floor. And so um, at the time, I just knew I didn't feel comfortable with that, but I knew I wanted to study some form of medicine and transition into that. And so literally I hopped on Google one day <laughs> and like the word midwife just popped into my head. So I typed it in hmm. and right at that moment, my mom had called me and she was like, have you ever thought about being a midwife? Cause she knew I was in between majors hmm. and thinking about it. And I was like, I literally just typed this into like my computer. Wow. And That's she was like, crazy, well, actually, your great grandmother is. was a midwife. She delivered your older siblings. Hmm. She delivered me. And I was like, are you serious? She was like, yeah, like it's in our family line. So she was telling me all these amazing things about what midwives do. And so I was like, I really want to try to figure out, you know, what this could be like. And so I ended up, um, I found a, an internship or volunteer program. And uh, I shot out some midwives in Uganda for a summer and I mean, I had my first birth experience, which is like a whole nother story on its own. And uh, I fell in love and I knew that's what I like mm -hmm. was supposed to be doing. And so um, I've been pursuing that ever since. And it's been really rewarding and heartbreaking and um, life changing for me, which has just been really incredible. So, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Great. So. I wanted to ask as well, um, mm -hmm. because I know that you are also a doula. I am, yes. What is the difference between a doula uh, and a midwife? It's a really good question. A lot of people get the two mixed up, especially mm. when they're hiring me as a doula. They're like, so do you deliver the baby? And that's honestly one of the biggest differences is that uh, midwives actually handle the the care of both mom and baby and the physio like them actually giving birth. And so um, they help to assist in delivering the baby and they handle all the things with that. Doulas are more of emotional support, advocacy, helping to prepare for labor, you know, that labor support during labor, especially if they're going unmedicated, it really is a mental game. Hmm. And so a lot of my clients, I mean, I support clients that choose to be medicated during their birth experience, but I, commonly the people that approach me are the ones that want uh, unmedicated birth experiences. And so I usually support my clients through that, which can be a really big mental game if you're, you know, going almost 18 hours with no medication giving yeah. birth. Mm -hmm. and so, um, so I typically help them kind of coach them through, through that and just I'm their companion during that time, wow. which is just really nice. It can be, um, again, like I said, it can be really extremely rewarding because you develop such a strong relationship with, you know, your clients, you're with them from the moment some of them call me like, I'm pregnant. And I'm mm. with them from the time they tell me all the way up until their baby's like one years old. Well, wow. you know, because I usually see my clients once a month after they give birth until the baby's one. Because a lot of the times after you give birth, you're just like you six weeks and you go to the doctor and they say, okay, you're good. You can have sex and we'll see you in a year. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And six weeks just simply isn't enough to recover from mm. something as sometimes traumatic as birth, right. you yeah. know, because it can be a traumatic <clears throat> experience depending on who's giving birth. And so um, the reason why I like to check in every month is because sometimes things like postpartum depression, they don't creep in until a lot later, a couple months in postpartum. Mm. And by then no one's checking on you because mm -hmm. you've kind of already maxed out that. And so um, I like to, that's something that I personally offer for my clients because I just, I know what it feels like personally to, just kind of be left hanging after giving birth and you're like, mm. wait, I'm still bleeding. I'm still having trouble right. with this. And everyone's lives have moved on and you're still, you're still trying to recover. So mm. yeah. I love it. I love it. But the biggest difference I would say is that midwives deliver the baby. 
Um, and doulas are more of the emotional, physical support sometimes, and mm-hmm. advocacy is a big part of my job as well. Which is huge because huge. Like, advocacy in the medical field is not really a thing no, right. unless no, no, no. you have had experience <clears throat> like being an advocate outside of yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, and birth but, is like just a taboo world unless you're pregnant. Like a mm-hmm. lot of people mm-hmm. don't know a lot about birth mm-hmm. right. until you're actually either your partner's pregnant or you're pregnant yourself. And so sometimes people take advantage of that ignorance, like in, especially within like different spaces, sometimes yeah. the medical space. You'll go in and they're like, oh, well, you need this medication because, you know, this is happening to the baby. And sometimes that's necessary, right? I don't want to dog on healthcare providers and what they can offer and what the hospital can offer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, again, it is taking advantage of people's ignorance. And so you end up signing up for things that you maybe didn't really want, but you thought you had no choice but to accept. Mm -hmm. And that can that's something I hear commonly with uh, clients that I have that have had births you know, in the hospital, but they just had no idea what to expect or what they were doing. So they just felt like things were happening to them mm. instead of mm. feeling like they actually proactively had a choice in what was happening to them. Yeah. And I kind of helped them by teaching them a lot of like the terminology and just kind of how to be aware of your body and what's happening during, you know, your labor process. And it's normal if this happens and what the medications do because a lot of people don't know that. And I think that's where the superpower of being a student midwife comes in because Mm -hmm. I can kind of tap into that and it kind of ups my level of advocacy for my clients. Mm -hmm. And another part is that when you're in labor, you're in like extreme pain. Right. And so you're not, you're not coherent. You can't, Right. You can't speak for yourself properly. And so yeah, that's not the time to be like making decisions. No, you're or, not, yeah. and, and sometimes we people know that, right? And so doctors know mm. that. And so it's sometimes things are just made for you or calls are made for you, or you have a partner who's extremely scared because they've never seen you in pain like that. Right. So they just <clears throat> they just say, give her whatever you need. And mm. you know, and so sometimes being able to coach both people through that and just say, Hey, like it's normal if your partner feels, you know, it go, experiences this, this is you know, if she's roaring on all fours, that's totally normal. <laughs> like, you know, it's part of the transition. She's about to give birth. Right. And, and just knowing that these things are normal helps you. And so, yeah, advocacy is, a, I feel like, sometimes the biggest part of my job, which it's annoying because I wish that more people were a little bit more hands off with like birth. You know mm. what I mean? But like, mm. It, for example, I would go into the hospital with a client and just they're offering so many different things that the client doesn't want. So it's just constantly, instead of me being able to help them work through their contractions and through the pain, I'm constantly telling healthcare providers like she, she doesn't want that or can we wait an hour before exploring that option because she mm. really wanted to have this type of birth. And, you know, and it kind of just takes away from me being able to be completely in that space with yeah. her. And that can be frustrating sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so diving into... You know, just your experience. You mentioned you were in Uganda. Yes, I was. <laughs> like diving into that a little bit. What do you think you took from that that you, mm. you know, implement today? I would imagine it's much, it's so much of a different experience than it is. And I would here. say that the healthcare providers there, the midwives that I shadowed are so skilled. Mm-hmm. And I really have to praise them because um, they, they really rely on their actual skills. Sometimes I think we're really pampered because we have so many tools at our disposal. Mm -hmm. I'll give a simple example. You know, um, I was in the hospital and I asked the nurse because they had a, you know how they have the blood pressure cuff machines and the machine wasn't working. So it wasn't giving my clients proper blood pressure result. And so I was like, oh, well, can you just do a manual blood pressure? And she didn't know how to do that. As, as a, a nurse, nurse, as a nurse, you got one job. You got one job, <laughs> no, and I'm that. like, that's just basic, right? Yeah, but that's, that's alarming. But like in Uganda, there's a lot of manual blood pressure cuffs because there yeah. just aren't enough machines to go around. Sure. And so, like, <clears throat> I mean, that's just like on the basic level. If you want to get more like technical, the power went out a lot. I was in the OR um, for a part of my internship at the regional hospital in Uganda, and the power would go out a lot, and so mm. we just. Well, people would just pull out their phones and continue the C-section. Wow. <laughs> I'd be like, oh my <laughs> goodness. You know, at first. And <laughs> I mean, crazy. 
It is, but they, cool, they really weren't afraid because like they learned how to work with yeah. whatever was provided for them. Mm. And so you just end up becoming really resourceful right. and thinking yeah. very quickly. Mm. So um, one thing that I learned that I've, I've never forgotten is, you know, when the baby's born, ideally you want to, you know, keep the cord you don't want to cut the cord right away because that's just great blood supply supply going directly to the baby. If you cut that off, that's just basically free oxygen that you're cutting off to the baby. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, when you are trying to tie off the, the umbilical cord, you, I saw this midwife just pull her glove and just rip the end of it and tie it, the umbilical cord. Oh, wow. Here we have clamps and all these things, but it was something mm -hmm. so small, but I was like, I would have never thought of that, but she just mm -hmm. worked so quickly and tied it and, like you just think of so many different skills. If somebody's extremely anemic, meaning that like, you know, you just can't see their veins, mm. you have and you have to give them, you know, an IV, they just know the anatomy so well. Like the, the healthcare mm. providers there, they, they don't have to think about it and they know exactly where to place the IV and it's right every single That's time. That's crazy. It's wow. perfect. Like wow. I was just so impressed, you know, and I just realized like how how spoiled we can be here. Mm -hmm. And just like, I could improve my, I, I felt like my skills were way more improved learning from midwives and doctors there. So it was a really beautiful experience. Beautiful. And I was, I wouldn't say I was humble because I felt like I just, I just was open to being taught. And I think sometimes Westerners go to certain countries, right. especially if we're talking about countries in Africa saying, I'm going to teach you this and mm -hmm. really don't know anything. And so I met a lot of students there who kind of had that mindset of like, oh, well, I, you know, used a manual blood pressure cuff. Or we, we have all this technology, so that's mm -hmm. why we know a lot more. But sometimes we rely on that heavily and the people who can just like, you know, I, I got gotten to the point where there was a woman giving birth like right outside the car and I, I could help and I wasn't afraid because I had been trained by people who like really quick on their feet and just would help you really understand your anatomy and your mm. skills, mm. Wow. you know? So it was just, it was amazing. I loved it. I think that's so interesting too. because I think sometimes we view less technological advance as like less in intelligent. Yes, yes, yeah. but yes. In reality, you have to use your mind more. Yes. You have mm -hmm. to think more, act more, be more skillful. Yes. So that's very interesting. Like you, they have tangible skills there in Uganda, mm -hmm. which we do not have here because no. you know what I mean? We can rely so much. I mean, there are definitely, I mean, healthcare providers here that I've met who are more tangible, right. but I think mm -hmm. that's why I love midwifery and more specifically out of hospital midwifery mm -hmm. because your skills, you have to be able to really act quickly because you can't yeah. just rush your client to the C-section if something right. happens. So I'll give an example of a client that I had last week who gave birth and it was a breech birth, meaning that the feet were born first. Mm. And here, typically in the U.S., if your baby is breech position, meaning that the feet come out first, it's just an automatic C-section. Like usually people don't mess with it. But what we don't realize is that it's because a lot of the OBs aren't necessarily trained in the hospital to deliver breach deliveries. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it's a C-section, which is extremely expensive, mm -hmm. you know, like and also and we, traumatic. it is, it's very traumatic and it's a long healing process. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there were more trainings to deal with breach birth, it wouldn't be as a taboo birth experience, mm -hmm. you know? And so my client gave birth in the breach, you know, the baby was breech and, um, at first, we, she was at the birth center. We transferred to the hospital just for, like, heart rate stuff. But, um, you know, the baby was coming as soon as we got into the room. So we're like, well, whatever was supposed to happen, we're having this baby here. And the OB that was there had never seen a breech birth before. Mm. Didn't and know what to do. how long had he been a doctor? He had been a doctor for over 15 years. Oh, my. Wow. wow. And that amazing. was his first breech experience. And I've assisted in three <laughs> and how long have you been a doula slash Five midwife? Five years. Wow. That's why. And right. yeah, it was breached twins and then another breached independent delivery. And then this one was my fourth. Wow. And I knew exactly what was supposed to happen and what to do, but you could sense the fear from him. So he was mm. pushing for the for my client to go into the OR. Let's just take her to the OR. She can deliver there. Let's just try to do the C-section. And we we're like, we can see the feet coming out. There's no OR happening. Like mm -hmm. we can't move her. Yeah. And so because of your fear, now somebody else has to yeah. suffer, That's you know, right, instead yeah. of saying, I might be a little bit more ignorant to this. Let me learn a little bit more and then come back. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes as healthcare providers, we're afraid to say we don't know something. And right. I think that is why a lot of people end up like suffering in that space because mm -hmm. 
like if you don't know something, being able to call in for help, but you don't want to seem like you're not confident in what you're doing, right? Yeah. But I think that's one thing I've learned um, very quickly is that you have to be able to call in your superiors if you don't know something. and mm -hmm. um, Or if you don't know something, find training so that way you can be up on it. Mm -hmm. So, I and, and I do want to say, I feel like that just you sharing that experience, it has like patriarchy written all over. Uh, just right. the fact that like as a doctor, you go to all of that school <laughs> And you know this a is nothing against the doctor, school. but like you're in school for a very long time, and you got your plus. residency and like all of those different things. Yeah. And the fact that something as common as childbirth is not covered, like yeah, as you, like, well as, enough, right? It, like you have to like you choose that specialty. So mm -hmm. like to go into the specialty of OBGYN mm -hmm. birthing babies, that's something that happens all the time. It's all not the time a rare occurrence. Different positions, and you don't even breach. know like everything about the birthing process, mm -hmm. it just screams of, okay, men were in charge of this from the beginning. Yeah. And I've even, I don't know how true this is. You could probably verify, mm -hmm. but I've heard that laying on the back is like the least yes. effective way to give birth. But yeah. that's the standard in hospitals is to put a woman on their back to yeah. give birth. But I that's can like actually the most, dive more into that yeah, because please. Louis the Fourteenth actually loved to see his women in the position of being on their back because it gave him sexual pleasure. And so when they were okay. giving birth on their back, wow. it was pleasurable for him. And so mm. people in France thought that he was a revolutionary genius, right? Because they're like, oh my goodness, I can see so much better, right? When the woman's in that position. But it doesn't help the woman at all. It helps the physician, right? Yeah. Because they have more access. But I always relate it to the equivalent of trying to poop or have a bowel movement on your back. Like you're just, yeah. it's just not as effective mm. because you're not working with gravity and it's just not a natural position. So yeah, that's actually where the history comes from. It's crazy. Wow. 14th and it's just based off of man's pleasure so which is sick i yeah, did not so know I, that's where it came from yeah yeah so <laughs> it's really incredible moment. but like i mean <laughs> minutes moment no. Yeah. no i mean i mean i mean historical moment sorry <laughs> that's what i meant like historical yeah, fact you yeah know. No, it's no. really fascinating and a lot of people don't know that because people are like i hated being on my back i couldn't really you know i felt uncomfortable mm. or like i over pushed and end up tearing and some people just naturally like you are you really enter a primal state when you're about to give birth like sure. i mean I, I i remember people telling me you're a completely different person after i give birth to my baby because <laughs> you really are just a mm. completely different person in birth so and, labor. and it can be yeah. scary when you see somebody because it you do kind of turn primal you're on all fours you're growling you're you're doing all the things and um that can be scary, but right. it's also natural for people to just do that naturally, mm -hmm. like women to do that and just be on all fours and just be like, okay, that's what I want to do. And so to try to force them into a different position, right. just simply yeah. because it's more comfortable for you as a physician is not really the right. best thing. Um, I mean, if it's helpful for, for, you know, mom and baby, then okay. But for the most part, yeah, right. to be mindful of that. So, hmm. so which yeah. is just crazy because it only exemplifies the fact that, so much is not for the patient. Mm. You know what yeah. I mean? Like how many practices um, do we continue to do that aren't for the patient, mm -hmm. right? Like that's just one great instance. And yeah. I wonder how many, I mean, there has to be millions of others, I would imagine, right? Yeah, like so, so many, many other things in medicine or in just in life, like that are not actually for the betterment of the person, yeah. Yeah. the betterment of the yeah. other person. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? And I think I... I I've talked to a lot of women post-birth and they just felt like if something was happening to them and like, say they came into the hospital a little too late, it was almost like they felt blamed for that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you should have been in here earlier or, you know, trying to speed along the birth process mm -hmm. by offering medications, mainly because they may want the baby to be born on their shift or you know, sometimes mm. that's not the case. And there is some form of disruption that happens and you need the baby to, be, you know, be born quickly. But mm -hmm. sometimes that is the case where there's a little bit more of a time crunch. And so, um, again, that's part of the reason why I wasn't really as drawn to the hospital and I really loved out of hospital experiences. Mm. But again, like in certain cases where you have to be transferred, I've loved that. And it's fine because, you know, the, the technology and you know, the advancements there have been made. So that way, if there are emergent situations, then you can be safe. But mm -hmm. yeah. we have to be real about that. And I think there's another layer, and hopefully we'll talk about that, but just I think being Black in the birthing mm -hmm. space is yeah. just, it's a whole nother level. You know, mm -hmm. being Black and dealing with medical professionals in general 
is always a scary experience, but then to be as vulnerable as being pregnant and then even more vulnerable when you're in labor and you're open and you're exposed and then you can't fully advocate for yourself, but you don't know enough about that space to even say anything. It's like somebody, I mean, if somebody were to throw you into the hospital and say, okay, advocate for yourself here, but you don't know any of the terminology. You don't Mm -hmm. know exactly what's going on, but you know you have to, otherwise it's literally a life or death experience. And you sometimes have to even go harder because you know the history and you know the mortality rate, right? Mm -hmm. Like we hear it all the time that black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or from, you know, childbirth related, uh, you know, and they die at the higher rate than their white counterparts. And I I think you always hear, but you don't really register that that's people and their babies dying. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and then you have to start asking questions because I will sometimes get from, you know, various people saying, oh, well, why can't it be all women or why does it have to just be black women? Or Because like it's literally quantifiable, like there are yeah. staggering statistics, like there has to be something looking into it here that we are not safe when we go and give birth. Mm-hmm. Why is that? And then another. If I could, sorry, just, yes, sorry please. To know, but just to, to yes. kind of put it in like more like more uh, simplified terms for, for people who might be thinking that what you're saying is that for every, say like there's a white woman that gives birth mm-hmm. and then there's, or let's say there's a hundred white women that give birth and there's a hundred black women that give birth. Are mm-hmm. you saying that for every uh, one white woman that dies in the birthing process, mm-hmm. three or four black yes. women will die? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so it's it's significantly higher. It like is. And if you, the, if you look, especially in areas and regions where um, racism, I mean, racism is all over this country, right. but especially in the South, you look at the, you know, the statistics there is actually really staggering as well, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a huge problem and they're calling it a silent epidemic, but it's so very loud because you're really, I mean, you're, you're cutting people off before they can even have a chance at life. You know, right. like yeah. babies are dying before one years old, two times the rate, you know, of white babies. Mm-hmm. And so you have to start asking some questions of like, what's going on here? And then why are we the ones as black women having to put ourselves in a position like we're already again vulnerable we're dealing with like whatever comes with our pregnancy and our birth and then now we have to literally fight for our lives in that space or rely on our partners to do that for us we just want to go in birth our babies safely the same way that other like other women get to do that and we just don't get that chance Mm -hmm. and it's really it's really heartbreaking And I think I personally, I mean, I didn't feel like I had to experience it to empathize with it, but Mm -hmm. it definitely added a new layer, um, having both the out of hospital and the hospital experience during my birth. Um, So, so yeah, I would say that it's, it's not only heartbreaking, but it's annoying to have now that problem is placed on us to fix it. Oh, well, what are we going to do about it? Let's have conversations. Mm -hmm. The conversations aren't enough. Like if you're, if you have a problem with me, walking into the hospital mm, and you see on. me and you have an issue with my skin color or you don't, that's a you problem. That's not my problem. Right. Mm-hmm. And now you're telling me that I need to fix the problem that you have mm. with me. That's right. wild to me mm. okay. while I'm in labor. That's, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. And I hate this whole thing of like, well, just check your biases at the door. It's like, you have to really be mindful of if this is the profession you want or not. Right. Because you are going to come into contact with various people of various backgrounds in, in, you know, the birth world, you're going to be coming across various women who do not look like you. And if you are not able to give them the same continuity of care that you would your white counterpart, then you really have to examine why you're there, right. you know, and, mm. and, and take a step back until you can figure it out. Cause it's, it's killing people, it's killing women and it's, it's really dangerous it is and you kind of mentioned um and and if i misunderstood you know correct me but you mentioned an at-home birth and a hospital experience for yourself yeah how would you kind of how did that Mm. you know go for you the differences yeah so when i gave birth to my daughter i i went into labor and i was in labor for three days (laughs) and yeah it was it was long and intense and um I mean, when I was home, it was really beautiful. I just like, I labored in the tub and I had my music going. And again, like as a student midwife, you just know a lot. Sometimes knowledge is power, but it can be a little like scary, right? A little scary once Mm. you're actually experiencing all the surges and you're trying to guide people around you as to what's happening. But Mm. yeah, I would like 
take my vitals and I taught my mom how to do my vitals because wow. I was like, I really want to labor at home as long as possible. I don't want to go to the hospital unless I like absolutely need to. Mm. And so by day three, um, there was a lot of exhaustion and yeah. my water had finally broke at day three. Mm. And um, usually in the movies, you see the water break and like you think that's the sign. That's rarely the case. Usually the water breaks right before you're about to give birth. Mm. And so my water broke and it was it was time. Like it was really intense. And again, it can look really scary to the outside eye. And so, you know, my husband was like, let's go to the hospital. I think it's time. And I was really scared. I didn't want to go. And I think you read about everything. Again, you hear about all the statistics and then you have the in-body experience of like, you go into a hospital, you see all white faces mm -hmm. that with no one that you know. You don't know anyone there. And you don't know how they feel about you. Right. You know, like, are you going to like, truly look and look at me and say, okay, this person needs a little bit more help. Or are you going to think she's not in as much pain or she can wait a couple more hours? Right. Or, like, how are you going to treat me in that space? And all this is going through my mind as we get there. It was like a 10 minute drive, but it felt like forever. Which is incredibly anxiety. Yeah. yeah. And on top of that, I'm, I'm at a 10 mm -hmm. centimeter. So I'm pushing at this oh, point wow. in the car. I get there, they check me and they're like, you're at a 10. And I was really scared. I was panicking. And the reason why I was panicking is because I was in the hospital and mm. I just didn't know what was going to happen, mm -hmm, you know? Right. Um, and fear completely entered my body. It wasn't there. I mean, those uh, during those three days at home, I was extremely calm. Like, mm, well. I felt really confident and it was, it was painful for sure. But I was like, oh, this is fine. Like, mm. I'm yeah. home. I feel safe. Yeah. But as soon as I got there, the fear completely entered my body. Mm. Even if like, and, and that's what you can't erase is even if there's someone who isn't meant to give you harm, but you just associate them with harm. Yeah. That's yeah. really hard mentally to work through because you just aren't sure who to trust in that space or who's right. going to treat you like a, like an actual human being at that yeah. point. And, um, yeah, so I got there and I was, I would say hysterical at that point because I was just so scared. I was crying, I was screaming. I was just like, mm. I just want this baby out of me, but I don't want to be here and I don't know any of you. And mm. I just remember the lights being in my face and people trying to talk to me. And I was still advocating. I was just like, I'm a student midwife and this is not... I was trying to give them all of my information at the same time that the surgeries were coming. Mm. And then I remember them making a call to give me medication. I don't know what they gave me. But all of a sudden, I couldn't speak. Like, I was talking like... I was talking so slow. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't remember much after that, to be perfectly honest. That's I remember so them saying, like, well, we could give you an epidural because it looks like, you know, it's going to take a little bit. And my husband was like, no, that's not what she wants. She doesn't want an epidural. And then they said something to him, like, you might have to step out of the room, like, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at him and I was just like, I remember pleading and saying, no, like, you can't leave. Like, you can't take yeah. him out of the room. Yeah. And so I was like, give me whatever you need to, but just don't take him out, you know. And so, um, yeah, it was a really, I, I would say that's when it started to take a turn and become traumatic well, was when I got yeah, to the absolutely. hospital. Because wow. it was, again, things happening to me instead of me feeling like I was empowered and making a call and right. saying, this is what I want. And well, I had somebody there who was doing that for me and they threatened to, to kick him out, which yeah, was just right. like not good. really not okay. And so um, by the time they gave me the epidural, I was already pushing. And so I actually pulled my do my daughter out Wow. I just reached down and grabbed wow. her. I was wow. just very, I, I knew that's what I, I I wanted to catch her. I didn't want anyone else to touch her. Yeah. So I, I remember putting her on my chest and I didn't want them to cut the cord because of all the benefits of mm -hmm. leaving the cord attached, but they cut it anyway. Mm -hmm. And they took wow. her and skin to skin is extremely beneficial for yeah. mom and baby. And it can help regulate, you know, the baby's heart rate and all these other things. And, um, they were like, well, we're going to take her for a little bit and put her in the warmer and all these other things. And I was like, no, I want her here with me. Like, I don't want her gone. And then she was gone for a long time, like almost two hours. Mm. And no one would give us updates on where she was, you know? And I was like, can you go and check? Like, can somebody go check and see what's going on with my baby? And um, they had thought that a couple of things. So she was born with blue eyes and they assumed it was cataracts in her eyes. So they thought that she had a visual impairment. Mm. And I mean, that just shows some of the ignorance there. Where <laughs> yeah, it's like, absolutely. 
like and that's part of the reason why she was gone so long mm. and so that was really heartbreaking to me to find out that like that's why i was separated right. from her yeah. and i remember when they moved us to the postpartum room everyone was coming up to me oh my gosh are you the one that has the baby with the blue eyes and i heard there was blue eyes we thought it was cataracts but it's blue eyes and like mm. all these random nurses that i didn't know and that's when I realized, oh, like this is going to be a completely different ball game for me. Yeah. And I mean, every postpartum appointment, any appointment we went to, there were nurses from other floors That's coming sick. and yeah. and you know, we, we heard about her, we heard she's back and all these things and she's obviously crying and she needs a shot and I don't know how to tell them to leave and you know, because yeah, I'm the only person there that looks like me and I don't want to stir up trouble right because right. you have you to just be really read woman. yes exactly you have mm. to read the room you have to figure out am i safe enough to say like get mm. the hell out of my room and yeah. i don't want you here and that's so what, intrusive yes, to right. be, it is very to be a, a newly what do you call it when you when you new, newly first, postpartum newly, newly mom. postpartum yeah, mom, yeah, yeah, yeah for them to be like running into your room to look at your baby and ogle you like that's very it's selfish it was from day one yeah it was from day one and <sighs> it was it was something that i didn't expect to be a part of like my parenting journey, my motherhood journey, but yeah. it was, yeah. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I took her to the dentist for her one year and same thing, bunch of, or, you know, a bun bunch of dental hygienists coming around. And of course she's scared cause they're all in masks. Yeah. She doesn't know what's happening. So she's crying her eyes out and I'm, I'm left with like a screaming baby and they're just like, wow, so beautiful, mm -hmm. such a beautiful baby. And I'm just like, okay like you know right, yeah. and so I, I i feel like she taught me very quickly that i needed to learn how to set boundaries and speak up mm -hmm. like i just i had to do that otherwise we were both gonna go through it yeah, yeah. you know and i think you've witnessed like what has in person mm -hmm. um some of the experiences i have and so you have to learn to set boundaries but learn what level you can actually get upset mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah i was gonna say not only have i witnessed it but i've also marveled at you your way of handling it because you are <laughs> very very like just diplomatic and you're excellent at setting boundaries Thank without you. appearing you know rude or aggressive Which or anything i like wish that. i didn't but have to feel are like very that. very rude mm -hmm. they are yeah. and i wish you could respond in a rude way but mm -hmm. like you do have to be mindful of like where you are and how safe you are in order to do that and yeah. i think that's kind of where I got that from was just like, okay, how can I say no? But it, it annoys me that I have to be polite about right. it, right? Mm -hmm. When there's clearly a violation or there's mm -hmm. clearly right. someone, you know, crossing a boundary. Yeah, because in those instances, they're not treating you like a person. They're no, treating no, you no, like, no. A, like a museum exhibit right. or yeah. like, like an object. Mm. Like, yeah. you know, and I hate to say it, but white people have a tendency to do that, mm -hmm. to treat right. black people like objects. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. Whether they, it's, can I touch human. your hair or touching right. your hair without, or like, you know, looking at you in a certain way or treating you in a certain way we yes. see it all the time with, with sports but yeah yes. the way that white people yeah. treat black people um mm -hmm. they may not even realize that they're doing it no but it's, something it's so that, automatic right. and yeah. so you literally have to claim your humanity for yourself and mm. say nope i'm a human being like yeah. mm. and so is she and um and you, you yeah i feel like you have to kind of really make a stand with that and i didn't expect that to be a part of what i had to learn in my motherhood journey but it's been extremely beneficial for for me and for her and for our family. So, wow, yeah, wow, yes. Thank you for sharing. I think what really stood out to me, like from your story, is you know before you got into the hospital fully, right? Mm -hmm. You you felt the trauma of other people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I think like even if you know somehow tomorrow everything went perfectly equal and equitable the trauma would still be there yeah it's yeah. still there and so i think it's just interesting to hear and also just know like even if you have the most perfect experience which you did not mm -hmm. even if you, a black woman had the most perfect experience the trauma would still be there because her, the other black women in this world in this country yeah. do yeah. not have those experiences exactly mm -hmm. and and i mean you'll hear that a lot where well i had a great experience and i loved my nurses right. i loved my and that's great but unfortunately <laughs> the majority mm -hmm. does not yeah. have that experience right. and so we have to address that this is an issue for the majority of people right. mm -hmm. and the fact that you are a min minority of of black women experiencing good like maternal health care is a problem mm -hmm. you know like right. i'm glad that you're having that but it's simply not the reality for a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of women and so um it's just something that has to be more examined and right. yeah you're completely right i mean i could have had a great experience but still been afraid to go into the hospital sure. simply because i know what could happen mm -hmm. you know it's the same thing as like 
if you get routine, if you get stopped, right, by the mm-hmm. police, a routine stop or, you, you know, it could be a safe ex- encounter, but there's that clench right. of like, mm-hmm. is this going to be that moment where th- this is the last face I see? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and, and that's really scary. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it affects, I mean, any death in that type of, in that type of manner is extremely traumatic and shocking. But I think it's, especially when you're seeing a black woman just just die right in front of you, like, mm. and their baby, or, you know, we've had celebrities, Serena Williams almost right. died, mm-hmm. and it was her white husband advocating mm-hmm. for her yeah. that helped save her life. Serena Williams, can you right. imagine if the news literally put out that Serena Williams died in childbirth due mm-hmm. to racism? Right. Like it's it's you know they wild. wouldn't spin it that way, but no, yeah, no, no, they would never. Would right. They would never. And that's the thing. It's very protective of making and that's why I think it took so long or why it was so silent mm. was because there was the mask of, well, there was this medical compl- complication right. or this, this, yeah. and that. But when you start to look at the medical complications that are happening, they're actually a lot of them are a hundred percent preventable. Mm-hmm. If you were to pay attention to what this woman was saying from the beginning, right. I'm feeling chest pains, I'm feeling some cramps in my abdomen. I'm feeling this or that. If you were to take that more seriously, it wouldn't have gotten to an emergency situation. It mm-hmm. wouldn't have led to her death. And right. there was a black woman earlier this year. She mm-hmm. was an Olympic athlete. Yes, she and died. she she died in mm-hmm. childbirth. Preeclampsia. Or, 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 yeah, pre- yeah, preeclampsia. Yes. Just, what is what is preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is high blood pressure in pregnancy. So. Mm-hmm. Preeclampsia is when your blood pressure is, I mean, naturally it's a little bit higher when you're pregnant, but Mm -hmm. it's like really skyrocketed. And again, it's slowly building. Sometimes it can come immediately, but for the most part, you're getting frequent checks. And so there are other signs and symptoms, including headaches and blurry vision and all these other things, which people are vocal about Mm -hmm. when they're experiencing those things. And so usually it's met with like, like instantly you're you're trying to fix it and trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Eclampsia, which is I believe what she had probably gotten to because they found her. She was in her home. She was dead. She was oh, pregnant. Wow. And eclampsia um gets to the point where you're now having seizures wow. associated with the high blood pressure. And those can be deadly seizures and you die. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming that, and I don't, like, again, I, I know it was preeclampsia the cause, but it could have escalated to eclampsia, mm-hmm. which would have led to her death. Mm. I think what's really sick to me. And she's an Olympic athlete, right? Yeah. Right. Go USA. Right. <laughs> An Olympic athlete or Serena Williams, like, yeah. women of that stature, mm. you would imagine they have advanced health care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if their advanced health care is not protecting them, mm. Than our minimum health care that we receive yeah, yeah. as like you know normal people mm-hmm. um is going to be much less. And it's it's sick to to know that like everybody is equal is being equally affected yes. by your inequitable exactly. your, your inequity, I mean. Exactly. Yeah. And well, if you think about it, it doesn't matter your status, your money, because that was another thing that was argued was like, well, maybe it's just the income or the lack of, you know, resources, but it's like you could get someone like Serena Williams, who is a multimillionaire, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. extremely successful, you know, um, American athlete who America loves, right? She's yeah. great entertainment until she's right. giving Arguably birth. Arguably the greatest athlete of all time. Right. Way. She's the greatest of all time, mm-hmm. period. And she's in still... In any sport. And guess what? That's all stripped away when you're literally naked and on mm. a bed and laboring yeah. and crying out for help and no one's hearing you. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're a Olympic athlete. It doesn't matter if you are a grand slam winner or, you know, mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. it's, it's completely stripped away and you are a black woman right. who doesn't really know any better. And like, you're not really taken as seriously or she may not be feeling as much pain as we think. Maybe it's just, you know, mm-hmm. it's just the the contractions and she'll move past it. Whatever they have to say to convince themselves that this Black woman is not going through what she's going through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're completely reduced to an object, right? Until yeah. your entertainment. And I think it goes yeah. back to, um, you know, all the nurses coming into our room and, and, and seeing my baby and all this other stuff. But when I was crying and in pain mm. and all these other things, I wasn't seen as a human being. Wow. And I think even in postpartum, I wasn't really seen as a human being because, I mean, it was like, oh, you, you need to have, I, I would get this, I get this a lot. Um, you, you need to have 10 babies because your babies are so beautiful. And it's like, Jeez. do you know how much at, <laughs> like at risk I would be just yeah. even, like being pregnant is a risk to begin with. Then mm. being a black woman who's pregnant, like 
It's mm -hmm. a lot higher for me. It's a huge risk, but I'm not a person at that point. I'm just someone mm -hmm. who produces what other would call more of an entertainment. And so mm -hmm. that's just fascinating. And so again, it's just that reclaiming of our humanity and saying like, hey, this is who I am. And I feel like as my job as a doula helps um, you know, women to reclaim that for themselves and say, hey, like I'm actually a human being. I'm a I'm a woman and I'm I'm birthing this baby and I I need to be seen like that. And sometimes you need to call in a lot of the physicians and say, hey, you can't just talk over her like she doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Or you can't yeah. just like crack jokes when she's clearly in the middle of a contraction and in extreme pain, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, it's just being mindful of, of that. But yeah, there's a lot of layers. And Serena Williams right. is always a perfect example that we go to. But again, if she were to pass away, they would say it was from a health complication, not from racism necessarily. Right. And it's because it's so like internalized and people just don't even know it's a part, like, like white physicians just don't know it's a fabric right. mm -hmm. of, of, of how they operate. And they're so unaware of that. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I want to ask about that because um, obviously what you do as a doula and as a midwife is, mm -hmm. is definitely a more holistic approach. Yes. And a lot of times in medicine, uh, more holistic approaches are looked down on mm -hmm. as like mm -hmm. an inferior or, you know, yeah, yeah. and I feel like a lot of that probably has to do with like white supremacy, but yeah, things yeah. like plant medicine, all of that kind of stuff, like mm -hmm. a lot of medications, you can find a plant that will do something similar yes, yes. in a different, you know, maybe in a different way. But mm -hmm. um, what is your experience like mm -hmm. taking a more like holistic and arguably more emotionally and like physically and spiritually healthy approach yeah. to childbirth and to medicine? What is it like taking that and interacting with these doctors who are predominantly like white males? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because I do get looked down on a lot because mm -hmm. I'm choosing more of a holistic or out of hospital experience. It can be seen as wild or why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And while there's a hospital right here, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, yeah, I definitely get looked down on, but I think what they don't expect because I do have the holistic approach, but I also have the medical like background and mindset as well. I can mm -hmm. talk your language. I know exactly right. what you're talking about. I know how to break it down to your level if we need to. And I think they don't expect that. Say, yeah, and so like that. I have definitely had experiences with anesthesiologists and physicians, OBs, all of them. And I'm, I'm advocating in a way that not only am I, I'm, they think they just assume I'm limited with mm -hmm. my, my, right. my amount of knowledge because like I'm out anything. of hospital, but it's like, no, I actually know exactly what we're talking about here. And I actually feel like have we explored this approach and I break down the approach and they're like, what do you know about that? You know, mm -hmm. some people will start to throw their degrees at me or they'll throw like, well, I wrote this, you know, dissertation. I wrote this article. And so congratulations. Yeah, right, cool. exactly. I've only tried my approach. Right. But, but like, right. it doesn't take away care. from the fact that like you've been a doctor for over 15 years and you've never seen a breach. Delivery. Right. Yeah. And it's like, no, or, no like, woman in childbirth has read your dissertation. Exactly. Like, right. like right. no one has. And we're here and now and this is happening. Right. Is this an option? Mm. And so, I mean, obviously, Obviously, I want to do it in a way where I'm not getting kicked out because definitely yeah. mm -hmm. that is something right. that can happen. And so I'm learning to talk to, you know, like, hey, we're both healthcare providers. We're both here with the purpose of helping this woman. Like, let's talk about what we can do to make sure we have the best experience for everyone, you right. know. And so that's something that I've learned to navigate. But yeah, for sure, I think uh, there's a lot of people that look down on the experience or even just if you're planning on giving birth outside of the hospital, you can be looked Looked at sideways a little mm. bit mm. because, you know, you're just taught that the hospital is the safest place you can be to give birth, but yet that is where women are dying the most. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's just kind of, it's a catch 22 where you're just trying to learn and navigate that. So right. mm -hmm. it's interesting, but you learn to stay confident. And I, at first I was kind of like, I would say midwifery, but wouldn't expand because I didn't want to say I was doing out of hospital or because I didn't want to be seen mm. as like someone that was unethical yeah. right yeah. or like mm. doing random things to women that like weren't safe for them you mm. know and i'm never like again i want to work hand in hand with those in the hospital but sometimes there is that divide because there are just different approaches to how we go about birth mm. sometimes so okay. yeah mm. so with that 
what are some of the advantages mm -hmm. of maybe pursuing an out of hospital birth or mm -hmm. working with a doula or midwife, even if it is in a hospital? What are some of the advantages of working yeah. with a doula or midwife as opposed to just a straight up like hospital birth? What are some advantages and disadvantages? I would say some of the advantages are, again, it is a more holistic approach. So we're looking more, not just, you know, obje objectively like, oh, these are your vital signs and it's just on paper, but like, did you get in an argument with your with your man today? Is that why your blood <laughs> pressure is a little bit like we're having different mm -hmm. conversations? We're mm -hmm. having like like what did you eat today? What's been happening more on the emotional side? And we're crying together. And those are things that like you just simply wouldn't get in the hospital. In the hospital, you get maybe a twenty minute you know uh, appointment mm -hmm. that you you know waited a long time for, right. and it's just covering the basics, and, and yeah. they. They just kind of, okay, next person. Whereas, um, you know, when you're sitting down with your clients and you're diving in to like more of your emotional trauma or why you don't want to be touched a certain way and we're going deeper into that and starting to heal that and identify that mm. and saying, hey, this could potentially come out in your birth experience, you know? Mm. Birth is, again, very vulnerable. So you're like resurfacing a lot of traumatic experiences that yeah. you never, that you've suppressed for a long time that we've all taught been taught to suppress and then all of a sudden you're crying out for people that you never wanted to reach out for before mm. maybe you were someone that doesn't like to be touched and now you're crying and, and asking for someone to hold you and mm. and so we're we're diving in in a different way and i absolutely love that and i just feel like you don't necessarily get that in the hospital setting and i feel like i've known my clients again since since conception which is a lot of healthcare providers in the hospital but I mean, again, we're talking about, we really are sitting and talking for a long time about um, various topics right. that you wouldn't think affect your birth, but they do, you know, and it's important to to look at all of that. What's the relationship with your mother? Do you want her there? Okay, let's, let's navigate that, you know, and then all of a sudden fears about motherhood come up and how you don't want to, you know, transfer that to your child or X, Y, and Z and those are just simply things that you won't really have conversations with in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I love how beautifully real what yeah. you're describing is like, yeah, a doctor that has been with this, you know, person since conception knows mm -hmm. them, but you know them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like do. it's a different, it's a depth, it's real. Mm -hmm. So you're a friend yes. as long as an, as well as an advocate mm -hmm. who can be there for them in a very supportive emotionally and every yes. other way, Absolutely. which I just think is, much different than how the doctor will ever have the ability to because exactly. they're somewhere else. And you don't know, I think another, you know, downfall of that is that you just don't know who you're going to get when you get into the hospital. You could have a relationship mm. with your OB or whoever and you're meeting with them, you know, throughout your pregnancy and then you go in and they're not on call that night or you have a new right. nurse and you never met them. And so even if you did develop a relationship with someone, they may not be the person at your birth unless they're absolutely needed and called in. So like, that's really difficult for a lot of people who need that, um, that connection in order to feel safe. And I think for a lot of black women, knowing that they can develop a relationship with someone throughout their pregnancy and then know they're going to be there during their birth and they've opened up to them and, you know, and they're like, hey, I'm really afraid of dying because of the rates that black women die in childbirth. And you already know that layer. Then it's just right. it, they feel an extra sense of protection there. And um, and I take that very seriously with all of my clients. But there is a layer there with the black clients that you have to be aware of. And um, I think I, I think, again, a lot of healthcare providers need to be mindful of that when um you know, dealing with, with black patients, especially because mm. there's going to just be that initial fear, initial right. distrust. Mm -hmm. And you have to work a little bit to break that down for them because it's hard. It's scary. And do you feel like the white physicians that you've seen, worked with, et cetera, um, have been aware of that? How, like how has that kind of that ratio of awareness been for the white physicians? I think it's kind of, again, like more on a, we know the statistics and what can we do to mm. help? And so they, I sometimes will get that from some of my, my white friends who are nurses, like, how can I help? I don't want, you know, my black patients to be afraid of me and this, mm. this and that. That's and good. that's just like, I, I love that. Yeah. I think that's great. I think you're asking the right questions, but again, now it, it's left on me to kind of solve a problem that mm -hmm. is just so, so deep within your community that I just, yeah, 
I mean, I can always point out resources or just say, hey, like continue to verbalize and hear them in that space. Like being able to feel heard is honestly one of the biggest things that could change a lot. Like if you were able to truly listen when a black woman says, I need help and not put any of your own biases or anything in there, you would be surprised, (laughs) you know, the results Mm -hmm. that you could get. Um, Because we know ourselves, we know when something's happening to us. Like no one else can tell us differently. If you have a twitch in your eye, you have a pain in your eye, I can't tell you you don't have that. You just know. And so I need to be um, sensible enough to just say, okay, this is is what you're experiencing. Not only experiencing, but it's actually real, right? Because that's sometimes what we think we're doing. We're holding space, but we don't actually believe what they're saying. But let me let them talk because Mm -hmm. that at least helps them feel okay. But then saying, okay, well, let's explore some options because this is clearly happening to you. And you give them solutions that will help with that, right? Then they feel a sense of trust and there's a bond that happens that's a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. But again, you can have that bond with somebody in the hospital and then they're just not there during your birth. And then you're you're with a whole new crop of people. You don't know Mm -hmm. what you're going to get. So it's interesting. It is, for sure. Yeah. So... Yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I've learned a lot today. There's a lot of layers there. Yeah, there's, yes. a lot. there's a lot of layers there. So, but really briefly, do you kind of mm-hmm. want to just talk about, um, if you're comfortable with it, you're, you're like mm-hmm. your social media, what you do on social media, yeah, like sure. the, the education that you do there, all of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I had had social media for a while. And then after having my daughter, I had suffered a lot of postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. And I think I it became an outlet of creativity for me, which was really nice. And then also, I just wanted to see like my motherhood journey in a different light. And so, um, and and the best way I can describe it is, I think as Black women, we sometimes really early on in our lives were just immediately told, like, okay, like. At least for me, you know, I'm not conventionally attractive because I'm dark skin or something with my hair or whatever it may be. And so you spend a lot of your life trying to find that happiness within yourself again, you know, and sometimes you can rely on other sources in order to do that. And I think the journey of my social media and just the growth that we've been able to and and the followers we've been able to accumulate is just really finding that joy within like my motherhood journey, seeing the joy of my daughter and um, and believing that that's, that's an image that I think a lot of people crave and we don't have enough of. Does that mm. make sense? Mm-hmm. And so being able to not only express that happiness genuinely that I feel in my motherhood journey now and with my daughter, but then also to to be able to touch other people in that way is just really amazing to say like, yes, we're you know, we're here and we can experience joy and freedom and hurt and pain and laughter. And then, you know, for my my sweet baby, she's she's absolutely incredible and has so many layers to her as well. And I mean, going back to the experience I told you about, you know, the healthcare providers thinking that something was wrong with her, like nothing's wrong with her, you know? And I think there is just not a lot of exposure to Black people who don't fit a certain demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that's one layer there is just bringing that happiness and joy to ourselves. And then also, you know, sharing that light with others. And then also, um, you know, just some birth stuff mixed in there as well, which has been really great to just kind of drop some knowledge there. And it's been really good, but I think I'm just letting that be a creative space for however long that we need to be there. And if we feel a shift, then we go somewhere else. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yes. but Do you just want to say like yeah. your app so yeah, everybody yeah. can find you? Um, it's Hey Cheryl. So H-E-Y-Y dot Cheryl, C-H-E-R-Y-L. And uh, mm. you can find us there probably cooking a meal or <laughs> dancing or running in the grass. And it's it's really it's really nice, you know. And I think it's important that that image of of black women is is seen and and it's important to see that absolutely yeah, yeah. i love, love that thank you we'll be sure to put your at in the show notes yeah. okay. yes, yes. <laughs> all our followers can follow you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that would be yeah. great that would be great no this has been really lovely you both yes, are amazing we loved having you here. enjoyed it 
Mm. Thank that. you. We're gonna for ask sharing. you on, on camera. How did it feel to be interviewed? Yes, uh, it felt really good. You know, I I mean, I, we have a previous relationship and friendship, which is very mm. nice, and I was able to meet yes. you as well. And you're just very easy to talk to. Um, so it's good. I think sometimes you always play things back, and you're like, did I express this well, mm. or did I communicate this in a way that I wanted to? Because you know that it can go out to many people, and so hopefully, like. Um, I'm hoping that it's clear enough where I'm not, I really am not trying to, it's, it's again, like a little bit of that people pleaser that I'm trying to like release and just say, I'm speaking my truth, right. but then also being aware that I want it to really transmute like what I'm saying, because mm -hmm. there's, there's real issues happening here that simply cannot be solved in one conversation, but conversations are starters and they help and they, yeah. and it, it kickstarts something very important. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the Black Menaces are a huge example of just being able to point out um, how much needs to be identified and work on within various communities. And um, it's very inspiring. And I hope that more people within their own fields can be able to, to do something similar to that because you've already taught people so much and have shared a lot of light on things that have been swept under the rug for a very long time. So. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yes, yeah, for sure. of course. So thank you. Thank and you for having me. I can already sense this is going to be a big episode. It's a, so. it's, it was oh, my great. goodness. It was yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, it was <laughs> phenomenal. So, I hope it's in a good way. I'm like, oh, I don't know. No, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Nothing People controversial was said besides um, my menace moment, whatever it was. <laughs> yes, we are not highlighting the No, bad menace moment. just want to put that out there. We do no, not. fact no. is what I was trying to so We disavow yeah. Louis XIV <laughs> and all of his teachings. And all of his teachings. No, but um, yeah, you know, if you, you know, if you are thinking, about going into the medical field if you know someone who is in the medical field please be sure to share this episode absolutely with them, you know because yeah. i think this is a conversation starter like you said yeah. um it's something that needs to be talked about for sure thank you so um thank you so much cheryl we yes. really appreciate you coming Truly. on and we're not done yet <laughs> oh okay. we got our recommendations <laughs> oh. um so you know we're gonna start with we're just talking about you know different things that we recommend i talked to you a little bit about mm -hmm. this beforehand I'll go ahead and go first. And my recommendation actually has something to do with you. Oh, my goodness. And what you put me through yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Man. All right. So I had a great time. I'll yeah, just start by saying yeah, that. Yeah. But Cheryl invited my wife and I to a uh, hot Pilates class. <laughs> I had no idea what Pilates was. I just heard about it. Lil Nas X said something about doing Pilates. So I was like, if Lil Nas X can do it, I can do it too. So I go in here and this lady had me doing push-ups and crunches and 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 high knees and kicks and burpees. And I was dead by the end of the it felt like it felt like two hours, but I guess it was like 20 minutes. I don't know. It was only 20 minutes? I, it was 45 like 20, minutes. Oh, it was 45? Yeah, it was wow. 45. So that was 45 time, minutes time, of a hit workout. <laughs> No, I was struggling. I was doing all the mod. I was doing modified push-ups. And I have not done modified push-ups since I was in my <laughs> high school, right? <laughs> I was like, nope, I'm like, and it was hot too. It was 102 degrees, yeah, right? Now. So I was just sweating. Degrees. I was like, man, this was a challenge. This is what the moms be doing when they come yeah. to work out. This right. is no joke. That's what <laughs> so I recommend uh, trying hot Pilates or trying hot <laughs> yoga or just try something new. Yeah. It was a new experience for me, something outside of my comfort zone. Mm. I left feeling uh, very sweaty. Mm. Very, uh, very muscularly tired. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> and also very humble. It was good because I tried something new. Mm. I learned a little bit, something more about myself. And it's something I would definitely go back and do. Cool. So you need to try really trying cool. new things. It keeps you like humble and it also yeah. just keeps you experiencing dead, the world in a different light. Because there's so it. much that we don't understand. Like, mm. yeah, so much that we true. don't know. Like, you think about all the people that you see. I'm kind of going on a tangent here. But last no, night, okay. I went to the Beyonce concert. There was 64,000 people in there. And I was like, there are 64,000 people in here. And I will probably never see any of them again. Yeah. Yes. And that was all at one time. It's crazy. Just think about all the people you see every day. Anyway, yeah. that's my take. Come on, that's wow. weird, though. Sebastian, what's your recommendation? My yes. Friend? I feel like my recommendations are always very serious. I don't know why. That's fine. I guess I just think seriously too often. That's fine. Here's my recommendation. Okay. This is something I'm not great at. Is I'm a very anxious person. I struggle with anxiety a lot. And so I, I plan my future out. Mm. If and Nate knows this, anyone who knows me <laughs> knows I could tell you like the next 40 years of my life, which is unrealistic, wow. obviously. Yeah, but since I was like 14, I had my life planned out mm. and it's changed, obviously. Mm. But each plan included a 20 year plan, practically. So when I was 14, I wanted to be a financial advisor. Fun fact about me. <laughs> um, anyways, recently I've been very focused on not thinking about the future at all. Mm. So like anytime I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? I just like, don't think about it. Yeah. So I don't think like basically past 
when I need to. Mm, 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 um, mm, mm. And it's very helpful. I don't know who had this hack hidden somewhere. Um, Cause all the other times I heard, I did not do them obviously. So I would recommend to be very, very present mm. to just feel where you are, focus on what you can and stop worrying about six months or a year in the future as much as you can, obviously. Like um, because it brings a lot more peace and it kind of lets some of the anxiety go. Cause you're not, running through situ- yeah. situations that have never even occurred. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, do what you do what you can. Live in the moment. And live right now, it. yeah. yeah. It's very peaceful. Really I recommend beautiful. it. I love that. I love it. All right, last but not least. Last but not least. Uh, hey, Cheryl, for me, what you got? <laughs> uh, so I love books. And um, it's kind of funny. I was telling Nate earlier that, you know, my managers, I'll hop on a call with them. And then I'll, I'll they'll always ask me for book recommendations because I'm always trying <laughs> to, like, get in, you know, two at least two books a month. And I would say some of the books that I've read lately have really changed my perspective mm. and just, like, my own habits. And the first one is Attached. And okay. it just basically goes through your attachment styles. And you'll be surprised, like, how if you heal your attachment style. So you have anxious, you have uh, avoidant, and you have secure attachment style, which is, I mean, ultimately you want to move to more of a secure attachment style. But it's really interesting to find out just in not only your romantic relationships, but just how you interact with people. Am I really attached to this situation? And am I anxious in this situation? How do I heal that? And so um, it's really been eye-opening for me and it's helped me to heal a lot of, um, you know, relationships that I have with various people. Um, another book is Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm. And it really helps you if you're into like, not only meditation and manifesting, but really diving into your body instead of being in your head. Because I, I get into okay, my head yes. as well. So when you were saying that, I was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, it's, it's really hard to not um, think, right? Because you're just so used to just like, okay, I need to figure out, I need to know what's happening. Hmm. I think that's, that's the kind of person I am. And I had to learn how to dive more into my body and trust what my body can do. Because right. there's a lot of things we do automatically without having to think about it, including breathing. You know, mm-hmm. that's not something mm-hmm. we think about unless we're thinking about it. And then we're like, you know, all those things. <laughs> right. But for the most part, there's a lot of things that but we can kind of move through life in that way. And it basically helps you to get into a meditative state where you can ultimately truly see like the best version of your life and start moving into that without mm-hmm. any effort or like thinking about it too hard. So I feel like those two books have been really great. And The Body is Not an Apology. That okay. one's really fantastic. Just to... Learn to say yes to your body and how you're how you're born and designed and and just truly um, embodying not just self love but like radical self love and mm-hmm. I think those three books have been incredible for me. I have yeah. more, but I will I write think those down. Those That's three have been. Oh, they're my... gonna be in the show notes. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Links to Amazon. And yes, yeah. Those those three are probably my top three books right now. Mm-hmm. I'm reading a couple more right now that I've I've been really liking more on the business side, and it's been fascinating. I don't know much about that, so I'm cool. writing a little bit more, but it's good. Okay. Yeah. As a book reader, I love that. So yeah. I'm glad you said that. Okay. Um, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming we on the podcast. Yeah, we're we're just about done. I got some closing remarks. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll call closing it remarks. This is church. <laughs> what? Closing. You know how they say in church they say closing oh, yeah, remarks? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, brother Brother Stuart Johnson will be giving us the benediction. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl, for that wonderful talk. <laughs> no, let me stop. It's struck down by lightning. All right. So um, if you have any stories you want us to share or people you want us to interview, um, or people you want to hear from again, please uh, email us at blackmenacespodcast at gmail.com. And then also be sure to follow us on all platforms. So we got Instagram at Black Menaces, TikTok at Black Menaces, Twitter at Black Menaces, and then YouTube as The Black Menaces. And you can follow us on threads too. I, man, If you do, you won't see anything. Right. I, <laughs> look, I, go ahead and follow though. Do you go ahead and follow us on threads? <laughs> sure. If you join it, whatever. And then you can also support us. Uh, we have a dope little merch store on the the blackmenaces.org slash store. And you can also donate. Uh, you can do monthly donations or one-time donations at the blackmenaces.org slash donate. Or we got that young Venmo. You can always just send us uh, Venmo at The Black Menaces. And it's a business profile. So you won't find it under people. You got to go to businesses and then type in The Black Menaces. And, you'll and if you us. leave my name in any of those comments, I will send you a personal note. 
just because I thought of it. So I'll send you a little right. love letter. Cool. Sebastian, <laughs> you get a, a love note from Sebastian if you, <laughs> if you put his name in, in the in Which the Which you note, probably so. won't, but it's okay. Yeah, I will not promise the same thing for myself. <laughs> you will get a thank you on the podcast. Thank you for your support. This is me thanking you right now. Cool. With that, uh, we appreciate y'all. We love y'all. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 